Moon, and welcome to another edition of Winning Wednesday, brought to you by the attorneys of Adair Thurston. I am Gabriela Vega, an immigration attorney, and today joining me is my dear friend and colleague, Brandon Cott. Brandon, say hi. Hi, everybody. Hey, it's so good to see you. It's good to see you, and it's good to see all of our friends out there in the in the interweb worlds, right? <laughs> You know, I will always say one of the best parts of my day, since I don't get to like be in the office, is being on video with you because you always make me feel like a hundred times better about everything going on. So, Aww, thank you, babe. I'm Same. really excited to be here today. <laughs> well, I'm really excited too. And one of the reasons that I'm excited is that we are talking about a topic that we've never even brought into Winning Wednesday, which is awesome because For real? yeah, yeah for sure um, because oh, you know crazy. knowledge is power and sometimes knowing how courts do things how police officers view things helps us help protect helps us protect ourselves from create making mistakes that end up costing us in the long run right for real yeah. knowledge is very much power in that respect absolutely uh, so i'm really glad today we are here to talk to all of you about uh, domestic battery protections from abuse, uh, petitions for protections from abuse and protection from stalking. So Brandon, let's start off with criminal battery, if you will. What okay. is a good running definition of what constitutes, uh, I said criminal battery, I meant domestic battery. So what, what's a good definition that we can start to use to break this topic down? Well, domestic battery is basically, so we know that battery is the unwanted physical touching of another, right? Yeah. Uh, we know that there's a... It, First year it, law it, school, it delves, you learn that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. It, it delves into a lot more complexity than that. However, uh, with domestic battery, we, we can generally associate it with like somebody who we're living in a house with, somebody who we are dating, our spouse, our you know, our roommate, and we'll talk more about that. But the fact of the matter is, right, like domestic battery is a, if it, if it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it's a duck, right? right. Um, we so, kind of know what it is. It's right. just, it's, it's the unwanted touching of another who we're in some kind of special relationship with. Okay. And so that's, that's actually my first question to you. You mentioned that domestic battery can be against somebody who you're in a special relationship with. That doesn't sound like it's just uh, as it relates to spouses. Is that an, a, a correct understanding? Right. Um, when we talk about domestic battery, we usually think that we have like images in our head of the people who commit domestic battery, right? But we know that it's completely different than that now. And frankly, the courts and the legislatures have really expanded the definitions to to include roommate situations. Obviously, we have same-sex couples, right? Mm -hmm. And we have um, people who have had children together. That have never so, been married. Right, yeah. yeah. So there's... So there's a lot of different special situations where a domestic battery kind of case could result if we have some kind of conflict, right? Okay. And, and that's like a question that comes up with a lot of people who I talk to, which is, oh, well, they're, you know, we're at K-State together and we got into this fight about whatever. And right. now I'm charged with domestic battery. We don't, we're not even dating. Got yes, yes, yes. And the follow up is well, you don't have to be right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so, no. So, so that, there's a lot. It's an expansive definition for sure. And okay, so so delving into that one a little bit further, um, in terms of domestic battery. I mean, I know there's some uh, issues that arise from domestic battery and some ancillary problems that may arise for people. Let's talk about why, and then now we're going to, I do want to go into just maybe, um, well, actually, no, I can't just say just spouses, but let, let's talk about a special circumstance involving individuals in the military, right? Okay. How does domestic battery 
negatively impact an individual who is in the military who is being accused of a domestic battery or has been who's been convicted of a domestic battery i guess would be the better approach well okay yeah amazing question and the fact of the matter is um, it has a lot of impact on you right because the military's interest in you is that you can hold a gun right so um there is a federal amendment known as the lautenberg amendment Right. which if you are convicted of a domestic battery or a crime of domestic violence, and those are going to be really important distinctions, right? Because certain other kinds of crimes like criminal damage to property, um, disorderly conduct, those can have uh, domestic violence distinctions, right? Okay. So even those crimes can have an impact on you. Um, but but the Lautenberg Amendment basically tells us that if you were convicted of a crime of domestic violence, that can have an effect on your ability to own and purchase firearms. Okay. Well, we know if the military is basically interested in you being able to hold a gun, right? Then, then if you can't, if you can no longer hold a gun, well, you've kind of become useless to them. Right. right. So, that's. That's a way of being terminated from the military, potentially being uh, released from the military and losing your job. Absolutely. Well, and so, so the Lautenberg Amendment, if, uh, tell me if I'm, I'm understanding correctly, means that if any person, irrespective of what their place of employment is, that is convicted of a domestic battery type uh, offense or an ancillary offense with domestic battery or domestic violence implications, that means that any person is no longer eligible to hold a gun, to, to own correct. Uh, firearms, correct? Right. And, and I will tell you that there is some, like, there's some controversy about that in certain respects, like here in the 10th Circuit, which Kansas, where we practice, mm -hmm. is in the 10th Circuit. Mm -hmm. um, they actually had a decision that said that municipal court convictions for um, domestic battery don't trigger Lautenberg. Oh, okay. So, so that's a very, very specific and special distinction. But yeah. that being said, yes, um, the reason that we're concerned so much with like military is because that's like that's an immediate firing, right? Right. Um, well, in that case, you you're being charged with two problems, right? You've got these criminal cases that you have to do. And I imagine that the next step is a, um, what do they call it? A chapter? A chapter. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and, 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 you know, for somebody who uh, works as a uh, jewelry, jewelry salesperson, right? Um, it's not going to have any effect on you because you don't need to hold a gun to run right. your job. But that being said, that's why we have some more special implications for military members. Absolutely. That makes perfect sense. Now, sorry for the long explanation. No, no, I'm no. It's a, it's a good explanation. And besides, we've always known you, you're wordy. So <laughs> <laughs> my superpower is talking. That's right. It is. A, it's a good superpower. Uh, we should tell our friends out in the world, though, that if they hire you, they are you do not charge by the word. <laughs> do not. No. I, that's that's the whole point of it. Is because I know how talkative I am, and I can imagine people sitting there laughing. Man, this dude just running up my bill. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I promise I'm not. I'm no, I. <laughs> anybody who claims that. I would like to have some words with them. <laughs> <laughs> 7,000 words to be exact. <laughs> <laughs> so now let's talk about in a domestic battery situation, you said, uh, you said something that was really interesting. You talked about ancillary cases, not just domestic violence, not just the domestic battery, but for example, criminal deprivation or crim uh, of property or criminal damage to property. Um, I am in my mind envisioning a situation, for example, let's say that I get angry with my husband and I grab his phone and I throw it and break it, but that was a phone I gave him for Christmas. I mean, I'm the right. one that spent my money on it. Am I going to get in trouble for that? Probably so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and why as is much that? As I completely, um, 
sympathize with your upsetness with Tom. He's such <laughs> an ass. <laughs> no, he's not. He's a sweet guy. Don't you let my mom hear you say that. She will come yeah. after you. She loves that guy. <laughs> I love, I love Papa Tom. So, so don't shatter his cell phone. But if you did, right, let's talk about what could possibly happen. Mm -hmm. um, so number one, criminal deprivation and criminal damage to property. Even though a crime doesn't necessarily say domestic battery, right? Um, it can still trigger what is called a domestic violence tag, a DB tag sometimes. Um, and what that does basically is it says that that crime has domestic violence implications. Why do we care about that? Because that same crime can then trigger Lautenberg, trigger, you know, our inability to own the firearm, but um, it can also add additional kind of complications. And, and when we look at criminal deprivation and criminal damage to property, um, a lot of times with cases that I deal with, uh, I'll have somebody say, well, you know, I, I bought the cell phone, I pay the cell phone bill, I pay for everything. Right. right. Um, it's my property. I've you can't people you say can't that. Yeah. Be, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't criminally damage your own property. Right. Actually, you, you can. Um, if, if, if you're married to somebody, right, and you know this is better than I do because <laughs> you practice sometimes in the divorce realm. Yes. Um, if you marry with somebody, you have a property interest, right? Absolutely. Like, that shared. I don't know. We call it shared or community property. Not community property in Kansas, but uh, for sure I understand what you're saying. And so, I mean, the example that I gave was I break his phone. I bought bought it, but I break his phone. Would it be the same thing if, let's say, um, not that I would ever do this, but if I got mad and threw something that was um, gifted to us by our by my parents for our wedding let's say i, I throw a beautiful vase at his head or whatever <laughs> I, right. i'm really not this mean you guys but i'm trying to give examples um you know it wasn't purchased by either one of us mm -hmm. and it was just a gift for the family that in itself is still um that that goes back to that criminal deprivation of property or criminal damage correct yeah, I mean, once I had a case where um, a client had printed off some pictures, printed off, right? These were not the original photos. Okay. And they were of them and the other spouse. And in an argument, they shredded those pictures, right? Okay. These, this is printed pieces of Xerox paper. Right. right? 50 cents um, worth of ink. Criminal damage to property. Oh, right. Wow. So, so in in terms of the common law, we would call those nominal damages, meaning it's bullshit. But, but it there's still, still matters. some damage. Yes, right. it still matters. Um, and frankly, in criminal world, it really matters because at the end of it, we can still be convicted of a crime. <laughs> so, so, so I guess what I mean to impart is, even if you buy everything, even if it's even if you're the primary earner of that household. That does not mean that your spouse does not have an interest in that property, right? You pay the Absolutely. cell phone bill, you bought the cell phone, you broke it. They still have a property interest in it. The Absolutely. law of property is unforgiving and weird. Absolutely. <laughs> so <just laughs> makes that. sense, though. And you're right. It has everything to do with I imagine that it does have everything to do with the um, mutual interest in communal property in a household. So that that's perfectly logical to me. Now, let's talk about another scenario. Let's talk about a scenario in which um, we, you know. I'm totally yoga-ing out right now on this, like, little ottoman. It's fun. <laughs> oh, that is that is fun. Uh, <laughs> I think you're going to be getting some good, like, stretching benefits as a result of it, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> It's like beautiful elephant tapestry. This is all my fiance's. I I have nothing to do with the beauty in our home. <laughs> well, he does have good taste, so <laughs> I I better not break it because I know he has a communal interest in it. That's exactly right. 
<laughs> oh, let's talk about an example where um, you do get into a situation where you and your spouse are angry at each other. You um, get physical with them and you maybe, uh, I'm, I mean, I don't, I don't want to give any like such defined that they, that people assume that it's, that's all there is to it, but, but there is an, um, offensive touching, whatever that may be. And a neighbor calls the police. And when the police comes, the, uh, spouses say, yeah, well, you know, he made me mad. I, I, um, threw a, um, I threw the remote at him. Um, and the police, uh, let's, well, in my scenario, we're, we're saying, um, let's say it's a, um, male, female couple, right? And the female admits that the remote was thrown at the, at the husband. I feel like a lot of times people assume that the, that when there's any type of domestic violence, that they always assume that the de facto is for the man to get arrested. Is that truth or is that a, a stereotype? And why? Um, I can tell you that that is definitely a stereotype, right? Um, it's a stereotype because legally, you know, with the Windsor decision, uh -huh. um, there are a lot of more legally recognized kinds of relationships. And even if you look at the Kansas domestic battery statute, it's written more broadly than just man, woman, Absolutely. right? It's roommates. It's we've had a child together. It's, um, any kind of situation outside of just man, woman, right. even unmarried, right? And I think that a lot of times the misconception is domestic batteries have, is something that happens against my spouse. Um, so no, that, that is a misconception. Now, the remote thing, let's talk about that, right? Um, because one of the other things about domestic battery that's kind of a misconception is well, I just, I threw something at him. Right. I, I tossed a glass of water on him. I was real pissed. I tossed a glass of water on her or them, right? Like, let's be more exact on them. Right. And we, there seems to be this kind of feeling that unless I hit them, unless I hit my partner, I, I didn't domestically batter them. I can't commit a battery. You actually can. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I wish I wish that I had thought about this before we had started talking today. I would have looked up the case from law school. There is an old fundamental case yes. from um, the common law, which is you can actually commit a battery with your effects. Meaning, if I throw my purse at you, if I throw a glass of water on you, those effects constitute a battery. Absolutely. Well, my recollection is that, I mean, it, the terminology, like you had previously explained, is uh, um, offensive touching. What, uh, something that could be a battery that's, that's highly offensive is somebody spits at you, right? Oh. That's a battery, am I right? <laughs> Did you ever watch that show, uh, The Flavor of Love on MTV? No. <laughs> oh my gosh, one of the iconic moments of the show is when since names named pumpkin spits on a, another contestant named new york okay and new york tears that bitch up just <laughs> like, but she and you watch it on camera and you're like oh that is absolutely offensive like, it is. that is the quintessential example of spitting as battery <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and actually because of that show they lived in the same house together so domestic battery law, right kansas law that very well could have been charged as domestic battery so let's expand on that idea more okay we we um remote gets thrown police get called not by either party but by a uh neighbor um let's say a a week, two weeks, a month out, um, you know, uh, the situation has resolved itself. And now the uh, person that I spit on says, you know, or, or the person that I threw the remote at says, you know, I know we were just, we were angry and it was a heat of the moment kind of thing. I, 
I think that um, I'm going to call the police and tell them that I don't want to continue to press charges. How in Kansas is that uh, likely to impact the case? Well, unfortunately for a lot of people who I talk to, not very damn much. Right. Um, you know, once once a case is started, it kind of goes down the tracks. And, and it's no longer your ability to affect that case. It is the prosecutors. They get to decide when to charge and when to pursue a case. Um, and let me caution what I'm about to say with a little bit of advice. Um, if you're in a dangerous situation, by no means am I ever going to tell you not to call the police, of not course. to get yourself help. Um, of course. Nobody deserves to be in an abusive relationship. Nobody deserves to be in a dangerous yeah. environment. So um, I'm actually, I'm going to post resources here very soon about how to file your own protection from abuse if you feel threatened or worried. Absolutely. Um, and, and I'm also going to post um, a, a statute for domestic battery. So here's what I'm going to tell you about it, though. If, you, if you're in a fight with your spouse, sometimes we feel like the only way that we're going to get that, that resolved is by calling the police, right? Correct. Um, I can tell you that in Kansas, uh, domestic battery is a mandatory arrest, which means somebody is going to be leaving the house in handcuffs, mm -hmm. okay? And then... Uh, if we have second thoughts about it, you know, a week later we say, oh, I don't even want this to go forward. Like, you know, we were just both really fighting and now we're okay. Right. Um, it, it doesn't matter. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody is very likely to still get charged with some kind of crime and there's going to be follow through. And, and I'll tell you the prosecutors in Kansas, the ones that I deal with, they're very tired of, oh, well, we were fighting last week, and now this week we're okay. And so I don't want him to be convicted of something. Right. Now, let's take that same example, and instead of the, you know, parties get back together, but instead of the individual who was battered um, saying, I don't want this case to go forward, what happens if the person who is accused of the battery says, babe, why don't you call the police and tell them, not to move forward with this case. By now, we're, we're perfectly okay. And, you know, I, I just, I don't think we need the police in our lives. We don't need the court system in our lives. How does that wow. change the dynamic of the situation? What other repercussions can come of the uh, alleged batterer uh, encouraging or um, promoting? Discouraging. Or, you can even say that, right? or discouraging, yeah, discouraging from the case to go forward or encouraging the individual to uh, pursue, to, to miss court, to not attend, to not want to move forward on the case. There's got to be different implications as a result of that, am I right? There, you are. <laughs> um, in Kansas, there's a crime called discouraging or intimidation of a witness. Um, and if you if you implore a witness not to testify and, and your spouse can be that very same person, right? If you do that in the state of Kansas, that can be a separate crime. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes even on the flip side, I have witnesses who say, you know, oh, well, when, when all this happened, I, I kind of fabricated the truth and, I just, I wanted somebody to come and stop this situation, and I kind of lied a little bit. You don't even have to say the words I lied. I right? about that. Okay, so what happens in yeah. that situ situation? Well, that's called filing a false police report. And um, if you get on the stand and you testify about your fabrication, that mm -hmm. becomes a crime known as perjury. So it's, it escalates. Like, I... Like I said, I would never discourage somebody from calling the police if you are in a dangerous situation. Correct. But please know the implications. And and when we're in these human emotion driven scenarios, I mean like hell, a lot of us are locked in the house right now with our spouses, Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And and if we get in a fight with them, sometimes our emotions take control of us and we think right. I just need this to stop right now. Just 
just know what will happen in the event that you do that. That if you admit later that you lied about it, that could be filing a false police report. That could be perjury. Absolutely. If you say, you know, if you say, oh, hey, baby, we were in a fight last week. And, and I just, I really don't want this stuff to go forward. It's going to have a big effect on my career, right? That could be intimidation of a witness. Okay. I, I don't want to encourage people into those pitfalls. And, 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 and in the law of domestic battery, they are unforgiving. Absolutely. So, like, I guess the best advice I would give you is immediately call an attorney. Immediately try and get yourself in the best footing if you find yourself in this place. Absolutely. Um, and, and frankly, I've been dealing with so much of it. Um, I've, I've talked to maybe <laughs> a week's worth two weeks worth of domestic violence cases right? just because of people that are locked in their houses right now. And, and it's hard and it's mentally, it, it, it makes us suffer in our mental health and Absolutely. just don't make a poor decision. For know? sure. For sure. Now let's talk about situations in which somebody actually is in a domestic violence situation, not, uh, you know, not a, heat of the moment kind of thing, but we are now um, getting to the point where somebody is in a situation that they need protection, right? My understanding is that after police um, is called that there is some sort of no contact order. Um, is that correct? And tell us a little bit about the no contact order implications from a criminal um, case. So that's, that's a good question. Um, generally, after a domestic violence arrest is made, there is going to be some kind of no contact order. Um, usually, it's a temporary order. It, generally, in the in the jurisdictions that I deal with, it's a seventy two hour mandatory no contact order, uh -huh. which means how many days is seventy two hours? Three I believe days. it's three days, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, so for three days, right, we have no contact with one another. That's a function of the law to allow us cooling down period to like separate our emotions from that situation and to um, not engage the other party. Right. Now, the fact of the matter is sometimes people want to. People want to text and be like, hey, baby, I'm so sorry that this happened, whatever. Do not do that. Violation of a no contact order, in fact, is a higher level crime than the original battery. Okay. Um, That's it's a class A uh, misdemeanor. So don't violate that order. And second to that, sometimes as a condition of, I've seen judges as a condition of bond to say, have no contact with the victim. Right. Um, and in that case, if you violate that no contact order, you violated your bond, in which case the judge can then revoke your bond and send you directly to jail. Gotcha. Okay. Now, let's... But then we have the separate PFA, PFA. Well, and that's what I was getting to now. Um, <laughs> so we have that no contact order as part of a criminal case. But if, um, you know, we are talking both to people who've been accused of the crime, who've been alleged to be, to have been uh, perpetrators of the crime. But, of course, we also want to, you know, our, our goal with this program is always to make people informed legal consumers, make them knowledgeable about the law. That's how we believe um, we should uh, work as, as lawyers, right, is to educate the world. Um, if someone feels like 72 hours just is not enough and they are actually in a situation where they're fearful, how does a protection from abuse petition help them? Yeah, so like I said before, those general orders that come down from the court in the filing of domestic abuse case, um, those generally last about 72 hours. They're okay. temporary orders. Um, you can then file what is known as a protection from abuse or a protection from stalking petition. Mm -hmm. And those orders can last up to a year and then even be renewed. Um, and, and so you file what is called a protection from abuse petition or a protection from stalking petition, and then you go to court on it. So right. up until that point, you have a temporary order that says have no contact with that person. But 
even after that, you have a court date that then says, okay, we're willing to extend that petition up to a year to tell somebody not to have contact with you if you feel like you're in a dangerous position. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in my understanding with the protection from abuse uh, petition, because I have done some of those cases, is that uh, yeah, you have. <laughs> when you first go into court, uh, you get an, uh, would, would get an ex parte order, meaning a, an order without um, having to put on evidence. You get a hearing date on which the other party has the right to come in and present evidence as well. Is that a correct understanding, Brandon? Yes. Okay. And it's, um, it's from that final hearing uh, where there's evidence on both sides that the court can uh, issue the year-long PFA no contact order, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of times people will say, oh, I've already got this temporary order. I don't need to go to court. You know, I filed for it, and I don't need to do any follow-up. Right. Um, you should. And in fact, I've had cases where you have the temporary order and then you get the permanent order, but it's sometimes the work of attorneys to then make sure that that temporary or that permanent order complies with something like, I don't know, you know, we have kids together, right? Yeah. Um, we have to exchange our children because that has to comply with the court's child custody order. Right. And, and so obviously if i'm going to meet with you to exchange our shared children then i'm going to have contact with you right so you want to make sure that that order complies with other obligations that you have so you're not violating it and so that the court knows that you're not violating it Absolutely. i mean you would think that that's just something that's common sense right but but it it's isn't. It's not about what you know. It's about what you can prove in court, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, so. and if, if there is a situation involving children and there's not a domestic uh, case, a divorce, or a paternity action involved, then you want to be very clear with that judge that there are children and that you don't, you're not uh, wanting to go, with, go a full year without having contact with your kids just because you now have this no contact order against the, the other parent. Exactly. Correct. Um, and in fact, you know, one of the ways that I met Autumn, who now practices with our offices, we yes. were engaged in a very difficult PFA with one another. And, Absolutely. And, and there were a lot of concessions that needed to be made in that case. And um, certain people had gun ownership rights, and we know that gun ownership rights can be implicated by PFAs. Correct. So it's it's a very difficult scenario, and sometimes, you know, a pound of logic is worth a little bit of history, <laughs> and you all that you need to do is have somebody there to say, actually, I'd like it to be framed this way, or I'd like right. the order to say this, and. And it makes a world of difference. I mean, it literally means people's jobs or, or not. And, Absolutely. And, 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 and with child custody, I mean, right. that's not even a realm I really deal with all that much. But the fact of the matter is it has huge implications in terms of, I got to switch my kids off this week. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, for all of our friends who are listening, um, PFAs can, in fact, sometimes include no contact with the kids, but they don't necessarily have to. You know, it, it is a situation of whether or not there was harm done to those children as well. Um, right. So I think that's I guess a good point to bring up. Yeah, I think I think it is just because um, it's not uh, it's not a automatic that you get to have contact with your kids, especially if there is a situation where there's violence perpetrated against the child. So um, that is an yes. important piece of the puzzle. Um, now, and let's, a parent can institute that in on behalf of the child. Correct. That is correct, Brandon. Oh. Um, now let's talk about the. Uh, differences, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that we could talk about PFAs, you know, somebody might think that a protection from abuse, once they have it, uh, because the judge, uh, a judge in a case can, in fact, include orders, for example, for parenting time, um, it can include orders for child support, they might think that um, that's the end all be all, they don't have to do anything. That's not necessarily true. Um, that is uh, something that, um, 
the, if you have children in common, if you are married to this person, if you have joint property, you might need to take a step further and um, contact us at 785-776-2000 so that you can also talk to somebody about a divorce, about a paternity, about a legal separation because when those orders end, so too does your child support, so too does your access to the house. And so the best thing that you can do is plan accordingly. So um, I, I, I want to make well, sure. I've even have P I've had PFAs and PFSs wrapped up into divorce and child custody cases. So the correct. cases actually become merged at that point. And that is correct. Yes, you're absolutely right about that. Let's talk a little bit just, just so that we can give in our, our public um, a little bit of information about the differences between protection from abuse and protection from stalking. Obviously, it sound, I mean, they sound different and people would say, well, of course there's a difference, but it's, it's nuanced as well. So can you talk a little bit about those differences, Brandon? So the protection from stalking and the protection from abuse really do function as their names say, right? Um, protection from abuse can be a little bit more broad than being physically abused, right? It's things that cause terror and fear. So Harassment. even emotional abuse, yeah. So even emotional abuse can be wrapped up into that. Um, but then when we have the protection from stalking order, we're talking about something where um, somebody's making us uncomfortable by repeated behavior. Um, I think the statute says two or more times, yeah. and 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 you know. It can be weird stuff. So. Absolutely. No, absolutely. In <clears throat> fact, I recall um, one PFS that I was dealing with where I researched and it had to do with a, um, I don't, I'm hoping not to put anybody in discomfort or anything, but had to do with a student and a professor at K-State and she obtained, um, you know, they were not in a relationship. They were, there was nothing um, actually, they might have been in a relationship at some point, but then later on, the relationship ended, but they never lived together, and the protection from stalking order uh, was used to protect her from having his arrival at sporting events that she participated in and things of that nature. Um, is that your correct understanding as well? Yeah, and, and the fact of the matter is, like, I think that that's a really important point to make is that it's not something where we've got to be in a relationship. We've got to be into some kind of formal thing where I need protection from you. Yeah. It can be it can be very standard stuff. And and like I said before, if you feel threatened, if you feel unsafe, talk to an attorney immediately. Um, see what kind of options that you have because just because you think, oh well, we're not dating each other, so it's not like right. domestic violence that doesn't always matter right and and that doesn't always mean that you're out of options and the fact of the matter is the law is written broadly for very specific purposes which is we want to try and catch as much behavior as we possibly can and it might not be criminal but it's absolutely something we can try and get protection from absolutely absolutely now brandon you had mentioned that you had some that you wanted to post some resources um yes can you share those resources with us and talk about what all is included in them heck yeah okay so um right now i am about to post a resource to filing your own protection from stalking or protection from abuse mm -hmm. so the Kansas courts do a really good job of making sure that you can access these kinds of functions, right? Not everybody has the resources to hire an attorney and that's yeah. completely fine. Um, this will walk you through how to file your own, what is called a pro se petition yes. uh, without an attorney. It's got questions that need to be answered and frankly even before you talk to an attorney i would encourage you to look at these documents because of the fact that um you kind of be an active participant in your own rescue yes right? we love that we love that <laughs> thanks thanks to the uh whitewater rafting coach that taught us that right <laughs> right so so it's important for you to kind of know those fundamentals before you start 
um, engaging in this process and know what it entails. So mm -hmm. there's a good resource for that. The next thing that I'm going to be posting is the domestic battery statue, which we've been talking about domestic battery. Absolutely. Know that there are other crimes that do not necessarily implicate domestic battery. Right. Um, criminal damage to property, disorderly conduct, um, criminal deprivation of property, those uh, aggravated domestic battery, right? When we mm -hmm. have some kind of deadly weapon or uh, threat of causing um, great bodily harm, yes. those, those all still apply. But yes. domestic battery is really the place where we're going to start. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Brandon, I am so grateful that we were able to have this conversation about a very important topic, especially, um, you know, I recently read somewhere, though I won't be able to give you guys a citation, which is, uh, in lawyer speak, not something that you should actually talk about <laughs> if there's no citation, but... Oh, please, um, <laughs> we litigate with feelings. <laughs> but... Uh, I have read that uh, since the stay-at-home orders have been put into place, incidents of domestic violence have increased. And so that was part of the motivator for uh, being able to provide some education for our public, for our uh, clients, for our friends and family and, and future clients, which uh, if you're a current client or a future client, we consider you family. So, um, <laughs> so we definitely wanted to share that information. Um, we want all of you that are um, watching this video, whether it's live or at a later date, uh, to feel free to contact us at Adair Thurston at 785-776-2000 because the reality is that there are a lot of things that we can help you with and uh, this is definitely one of those. Uh, whether you're in need of protection, um, through PFAs, through domestic um, pleadings, paternity cases, those divorces, or whether you're a criminal defense client um, that has been accused that you're the alleged perpetrator, uh, Adair Thurston can help. We're here to help. Um, caveat, we always have, uh, we do, can only represent one side of the coin. So um, be smart and be the first person to call 785-776-2000. <laughs> you know, one of the things I always tell people is with these kinds of cases, you know, we have so many emotions happening right now. And, yes. and it's really difficult. The fact of the matter is, is that we live in a world of gray area. We do. And a lot of people are really uncomfortable with that. You know, they think there's black and white, right? It's, it's domestic battery or it's not. It's whatever. Yeah. One of the facts is, is that there is so much going on right now. Mm -hmm. And number one, it's okay to seek help. If you need Absolutely. mental health resources, reach out to us. Absolutely. One of the great things about being a criminal defense attorney is I have access to some of the greatest mental health resources in the state. Um, I've made connections with really great people, but aside from that is it's okay to not be okay. Absolutely. Right? And, and so there are family issues and family implications for all of these cases. And, and we will try and help you as best we can, because like, frankly, yes. like that's just the people that we are. Yes. But, but the fact of the matter is nobody deserves to feel unsafe. Okay. If you feel unsafe, call somebody. Absolutely. Um, if you feel unsafe, call us and see if we can help you. Um, if you we certainly if you're will charged try. with a crime, right? Like if you're charged with a crime, like we'll we'll talk to you. You know, everybody's not the worst thing that they've ever done. And absolutely. Until you know, I've I worked on some murder cases, some high level sex felony cases, and the fact of the matter is is the human experience can't be isolated to one incident. Um, right. So, so there are answers for you and, and there's a place for you to go. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. I just, I hope that at the end of the day, everybody knows that we're there to talk to them about the deep questions that kind of concern them. Absolutely. Something I like to say, and I, um, We'll continue to push our um, managing partners to uh, use as a uh, logo slash tag, or not logo, but tagline is Adair Thurston. We can help. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, I, I told somebody today that I think that the best 
title for my job is not attorney, but uh, professional damage mitigator. Oh, yes. The, the fact is, is that shit happens. Shit okay. happens. And it happens a lot with families. And it happens a lot with close relationships. And I'm not here to sit and judge you and say this was right or this was wrong. But how do we go from this position to a better one? Absolutely. You know? If we need mental health treatment, how do we get mental health treatment? How do we if, make it so that it doesn't happen again, right? I mean, people right. do continue in relationships sometimes despite these types of problems, and that's okay as long as if it does, if it did happen, that that uh, efforts are made to not make it happen because nobody deserves to live in in fear for their life, for their safety, for their well being. So I absolutely and everybody agree. Everybody deserves to live in a happy life with their loved one. You know, absolutely, absolutely. I'm sure you felt like hitting me so many times. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm so thankful you haven't. Because <laughs> baby, I, I, I hit hard. <laughs> I know. I know who your trainer is. <laughs> My trainer is the uh, best. Walt. Love you, Walt. bud. Yeah, like, hashtag bar fitness. Walt. Loving you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Brandon, next week, same bat time, same bat channel, except we're going to be discussing immigration law, right? Are you ready for yes. that one? Oh, I'm so excited. And it's, um, special juvenile uh, status. Correct. Special immigrant juvenile status. I will be in the hot seat and uh, my darling Brandon will serve as the interviewer. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Tell your friends uh, about us. Tell your friends about our videos if you have questions. And look up our, pa our, our um, old videos. There's a wealth of knowledge, a, a library of information about Kansas law, whether it be criminal law, estate planning, family law, immigration, hemp law, wills and trusts. We know it all. <laughs> or Well, we know, but many, we got somebody that does a little bit of everything. How many videos have we been through at this point? So, Brandon, I recently checked, and I think we have over 30 videos now. Oh, man. It so. feels like just yesterday we were filming with our handy cam in the <laughs> office conference room. Uh, I miss our office conference room. So, but. Tell me about it. I, I miss it all, too. Yeah. We'll miss be back you there. Too. Miss you, too, babe. But so. we'll be back next week, you guys. Thank you so much. Take care of each other. We appreciate you, and thank you for being here. Bye. Bye-bye.